It's really great to be here, actually. I'm really encouraged. Uh, already last night, getting to hang with some people, and now today, and so thanks for, it's always an honor. Thanks for being honorable, you know, that you would actually show up to, to hear somebody. I don't know if you ever like, wonder about that, if you're a teacher or preacher, if you go like, what, what business do I have talking? And uh, thankfully, God's gracious, and he lets us do this, so thank you for honoring me in that. I, it really is a privilege. What I want to do is uh, start with introducing a little bit of myself and some of our story, uh, but I want to pray again as well, just that the Lord would guide us and direct our hearts towards what He has for us today. Lord, we, we come to You and we acknowledge that there is only one head of this church, and it's You. It's not ours. That we don't build it, You do. That we don't save people, You do. That we don't change a country, You do. And so we submit to you, and we acknowledge our helplessness apart from you. We agree, Jesus, apart from you we can do nothing. So we want to abide in you as you abide in us by your Spirit. Holy Spirit, would you make Jesus known? Please help us to humble ourselves and admit that we don't fully know you that well yet. So Lord, uh, we, we want to be humble before you that you might in due time lift us up. We want to experience your grace poured out into our lives through your Spirit. So we pray that you confront our unwillingness, our arrogance, our pride, anything that would stand in the way of us acknowledging our great need for you today. And we invite you to have your way in us. And we ask for the good of this nation. That Jesus, you would be known that you would pour out your spirit, that you might bring about a renewed heart, that you might reach the cities, in particular Sydney and the surrounding area, Lord, help us, help us, help us. Thank you that you are more than able, that this is not up to us, it's up to you, so we acknowledge that together. Please help us today, in Jesus' name, amen. All right. Well, I, um, I'm married to Janie. We've been married for 21 years, and I met her in Seattle when I first uh, started uh, as a youth pastor there. That was kind of my first experience in church. Um, it was a, a fairly conservative church, a Christian Reformed church. Some of you might know of that. I don't know if you have many of those here. Probably not many, but there's some. I am Dutch, so that's... Uh, Yes. I knew I'd get something from you on that one. Um, there's a few of you in the room. And, uh, and that was a good experience. I learned a lot. Um, and uh, my wife and I then moved to Chicago. We stepped into a church where the youth pastor had been sexually involved with the students. And he went to prison for it. So it was a really broken situation. The first church, we kind of built something from nothing. The second church, we had to rebuild something. So um, I've kind of been in both startup as well as restart phases. Uh, the second church is about 4,000 people, so it was a pretty sizable impact of that guy's sin. So I, I understand the impact of sin and how it hurts people really badly. I remember when I first showed up, the, the, several of the students, some of the guys, the young guys I started meeting with, uh, cussed me out at least three or four times. And they just didn't know what to do with all their anger against their previous youth pastor, so I was the new object of their, their uh, aggression. And the Lord gave me a lot of grace in that, just to be able to like receive it and just go like, yeah, I know they just hurt, and they're just trying to work it out. So I was thankful that He helped me because that's not easy to take. Um, but the Lord was really gracious in that, and we got to see a, a ministry rebuilt, and students really stepped into taking seriously with Jesus' command to make disciples who make disciples. And I saw junior high and high school students very seriously engaged in the mission, and uh, and that was a real privilege. And uh, I love I love that about. Younger people, there's a certain kind of youthful idealism that actually believes God at his word. And it's sometimes I think when you get older, you start to become more cynical, unfortunately, and you, be, and you become less filled with the faith that God could do anything uh, because you've seen enough people not walk in faith, so you start to wonder if he can do anything. And I love that about Jesus and saying, I don't, don't keep the little ones from coming to me, such is the kingdom of God. And so, I mean, I think one thing I love about working with kids um, of which I have three. I have a 12-year-old daughter, a 10-year-old son, and a 7-year-old daughter. 
Haley, Caleb, and Maggie. One thing I love about kids is, is they, they really do like, think it's possible for God to do anything. You know, um, my kids actually think I'm a millionaire. It's always funny when they tell me that. I'm not, just so it's clear. Um, but uh, even the other day, Maggie said, Dad, you're rich. And I'm like, well, yeah, I guess that defines, depends on how you define it. Compared to the world, we're very rich. She's like, you could buy anything. And I'm like, well, maybe not. <laughs> uh, so but you do have a rich dad. It's just not me, you know. The Heavenly Father is really loaded. He's got a ton of money and uh, all the resources we need. So we don't have to worry about that. But I love that about little kids, and I, I love seeing that in, in junior high and high school students, too, this idealism, this hopefulness, this optimism about God's abilities. And uh, I always enjoyed working with, I still do work with youth, but that, that's something I really enjoyed. I'm meeting with a young man right now, his name is Mushan, and I'll tell you more about them later in terms of how he came to faith. But, um, but he's, uh, he's 14, and I, I, he's just got this hopefulness that he thinks God could use him to do mighty things in the world. And I love that. Why do we lose that? Why do we start thinking that God can't still do what he did? You know, he hasn't changed. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And then I got called from that place to Willow Creek, and they had a falling out in their leadership. It was, thankfully, it wasn't sexual sin, but it was still brokenness. And all three of, their, two, three of their most prominent leaders were all put in different places in the church to go through a year of discipline, and, which I thought was really remarkable. Most churches just kick people out, and Willow was really committed to health and healing and and paid for them to just be cared for for a year. And all three of them are now in ministry in different places around the world, and it's beautiful to see that God really used the church to do her job. Uh, so it was, it was a good experience. I saw that there. But I walked into a situation where they asked me to kind of redesign things, and so we moved from everything being at the building to uh, some being at the building and a lot being out in the community. And we got to decentralize a very, very big ministry. Some of you know, if you've heard of Willow Creek, you know, at that point it was about 23,000 people, but I was just in charge of the high school and, and junior high. But it still represented, by the time I left, several thousand kids, which was a lot of work. But what I saw there was the same thing I saw in the previous church and the previous church before that, which is when young people trust God and love Jesus and have the power of the Spirit, they can be faithful to do everything you see in the Bible. You know, they can, they can experience acts take place, where the Spirit fills them and sends them and empowers them to be His witnesses, where they get to lead people to Jesus, where they get to build people up in Christ. And so I watched students over and over and over again make disciples who made disciples. But then I watched something happen in every one of those churches, and that is every one of them had the kids graduate, and the kids called it big church. They graduated a big church. And often what that meant was it was the end of them being on the mission, because now they're going to go to work. And uh, now they're going to be an adult and have a real life. And what it meant is you just attend church on Sunday and for a few hours and you give and you're a good member and maybe you serve in the children's ministry or something. But that was kind of the, the extent of what it meant to be the church from that point on. And a lot of them became very, very disillusioned as I watched many of them leave the church because it, it, they were part of the game and then they got told to sit, take a seat. Uh, years ago, I, I, I played hockey growing up in Michigan and I got, I got the opportunity when I was 16 to get called up to uh, junior pro and to move up to Canada, and I would have had to live there, and that's kind of your way to make it into the NHL eventually. So you have to, that's kind of, you, then you start playing that circuit. And I said no to it. I, just, uh, I knew some professional hockey players. They're friends of ours, and the, the lifestyle of a hockey player is horrible on the road, and I'd, I'd already been in enough in junior hockey seeing everything a kid shouldn't see at the ages of 14, 15, and 16, and I thought, I didn't really want that lifestyle. So I said no, but when I said no, I pretty much put up my skates and my stick and stopped altogether because when you know that you could make it in professional, you don't want to play rec hockey. Now, not for, it's not sure that I would have made it professional, but when you think you could have, who wants to go back and play just normal recreational hockey? And so I just stopped playing altogether. And I think that's what's happened to a lot of people in the church, is that they read the scriptures and they see that we're supposed to be playing in the game. We're, I mean, when you read this, you go, this is an adventure. This is a grand journey that God's calling you on to participate in this work and changing the world. And then you go to church and you go, it feels like I could just sit at home and watch it on a screen, and that would be sufficient, because that's kind of what we're saying it is. And I think it's a great disservice to what God calls his people to be. Uh, we're not called to be spectators watching someone else play the game. We're called to all be in the game 
playing with the power of the Holy Spirit, experiencing the very same things Jesus' disciples were meant to experience. When Jesus said that you'll do even greater things than, than me, when he took, prayed in John 17 that those who would believe would experience the same kind of unity and power that the early church would, he really meant it for us. He just didn't mean it for the first hundred years until we, we get a canonization of the scriptures and then we're done. He meant it so that we would all do it until he comes back and we would be found ready uh, and his readiness was we would be in the game, we would be doing the mission, and we'd be doing it until he returns. And so I, my heartbeat for the church, my heartbeat for you, is that we wouldn't settle any longer with the majority of the church being spectators, with the majority of the church primarily seeing church as a one or two hour event on Sunday, but rather the people of God and the mission of God in all of life. So that's what I hope to get after today together with you. And that's what's driving me. Um, our, our nations, our, our world will not ever uh, be changed if that doesn't happen. For some reason, God has determined that he wanted us to be a part of the way he would bring about his work throughout the world. Now, I don't understand that because I would have chosen a better vehicle, but he chose us. So, <laughs> so I think it's because he knew at the end of the day he would get credit for it instead of us because no one would be able to explain it other than God must have done this, because how does he do it with a bunch of riffraff, like the fishermen and the tax collectors and the zealots? and the, I mean, look at Jesus' early followers. Like, that is not your all-star team, let's be clear. Okay. You know, he did not go after the most likely. He went after the most unlikely, so at the end of the day, it would be apparent that he did it instead of them. So, so I just want to encourage you. Maybe you're feeling that way even. Like, gosh, I don't know how God could use me. I'm a mess. I can't even get up on time, you know, and, let alone pray and read my word, read the word, and you know, talk to my friends about Jesus. Not like, uh, how can he do, use me? And the beauty is, is that makes you most likely. Uh, the, the the less confident you are in yourself, the more likely God is to use you, because uh, He loves to use people who can't give credit to themselves, but will give credit to Jesus. So, so if that's you, that's a good thing. You know, I'm weak, I'm broken, I don't have hardly anything. Yes, <laughs> you're perfect for their job. So. So let's start with that, and, and I, I want to I just start with this question today. Oh, this is going to be dangerous. Let's, I don't want to hurt your guitar. Let's, there we go. It's not yours? <laughs> like, hurt it, I don't care. <laughs> okay. So I want to I start with a question, because part of what we have to do in order to have the conversation I want to have today is we have to ask ourselves, how do we define the church? Because... I think, I think if you start with the wrong understanding of who the church is, you'll end up with the wrong activity of what we do. So, but before I t ask you to tell me what you think it is, I want you just to kind of in a general way ask, when most people hear church, what do they tend to think of? How would they, def how would they define what church is? Okay, many would say it's a building. Men wearing funny robes. Okay. Funny robes. <laughs> I don't even know how to spell robes. <laughs> service, okay. Sunday event. Okay. 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 Uh, maybe me time. What was that? Me time. Me time. Okay. Well, yeah, just kind of me and God. It's kind of your, your injection for the week. To get okay. Through. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So the bigger, the more successful. Okay. Yeah, so. So that might be how we, how we measure the effectiveness of the church is larger equals better or effective, you know? So I won't write that, but I'll just say it out loud, yeah. Okay, anything children. else? What? It's for children. It's for children? Okay. Old-fashioned, not relevant. Okay. Irrelevant. Uh, moral. Moralistic. Okay, moralistic. Suspicious people. <laughs> okay. You 
guys love the church, I can tell. <laughs> I can see why so many people are a part of it in this country. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, yeah, a lecture. Okay, we could keep going. Um, what I, what I want to do is just stop and recognize the majority of people don't see the church as a people. They see the church as an event or activities, uh, things we do, things we go to. Uh, and, and that's clearly not how the Bible describes church. In fact, um, it's interesting. If you do, if you do a, some work in, the, in the, the Bible around church, the, you won't find church being defined by activities. You might see descriptions of activities that the church is involved in, but when, when, when the church is told what they are, it's always about their personhood. It's always about God's people. It's, a, it's identity uh, that, God, that the Word of God talks about when he defines his church. Uh, it's not activity. Uh, in fact, uh, it's interesting if I were to, to like just ask any seminary professor who maybe teaches on the nature of the church, uh, they would likely have very little identity language in their definition. Uh, in fact, I, this would be a fairly typical evangelical definition of the church. The church is the people of God. There would be one personhood identity statement there. People of God. And usually they'll say the regenerate people of God, hopefully. Uh, the regenerate people of God who gather regularly. Just pay attention to how many things I'm going to say now that are activity-based, not identity-based who gather regularly for the teaching of the Word and the uh, observation of the sacraments, particularly baptism and, and Lord's Supper, underneath biblically qualified elders who exercise church discipline and ensure the church is being faithful to her commission of making disciples who make disciples. Now, if I said that, most of you go like, that's a great definition of the church. But the problem is only one of those things in there has to do with who you are. The rest of it has to do with everything we do. And the problem with that is you actually could do everything I just said without being God's people. And lots of people do. There are plenty. Of, I've, I've been amazed at how many times I've been in a room talking to church leadership uh, about the gospel of Jesus Christ and they come to faith in Jesus and they become regenerate on the spot. But they've been running churches for years. And that's part of the problem is we actually have unregenerate people leading churches around the world in some cases. And that, that's, that's because... A lot of the way we've defined church is, church is what we do. And the problem with that is, you can be a non-Christian and do all of it, fundamentally. I mean, you can, these days, I say this at least in, in, in my continent, um, you can, and I don't know if that's true here, but in, in where I live, people have so, so well designed how to pull off the Sunday gatherings that you could be a non-Christian and pull it all off. You could, I mean, it's, it really is just, just do this, 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 and this, and you can do it. Now, will it have the power of the Spirit? Well, no, I don't think so. I mean, but we have plenty of churches, and I'm, I'm convinced that there's more and more in my country that are not Christian, but they are churches in the way we've defined them, unfortunately. Uh, and so that's a problem because the Scriptures are clear. It's not a matter of what you do that makes you who you are. It's what you are that make, leads you to what you do. In like fact, this is the direction of how the Bible works. Our being leads to our doing, not the other way around. Worldliness says our doing leads to our being. What you do makes you who you are. Okay? Uh, in fact, think about this. When's the last time you met somebody? You know, and I'll just, just say, hi, my name is Jeff. Hi, I'm Libby. Libby? Yeah. Nice to meet you. Yeah. What do we normally do after... What do you do? Now, why would, I, why would I do that? I got your name, and the next thing I ask is, what do you do? Because we actually define people by what we do. I think if I find out what you do, I'll figure out who you are. Okay? So, hi, my name is Jeff. Hey, I'm Libby. Libby, who are you? Uh, <laughs> I'm a girl. <laughs> I did that once. Sorry that I put you on the spot, but you were a great... You were, Yes, you're not, you're not that red, just so you know. I did that with a, a, a leader in a church once, similar type of thing. I said, hi, I'm Jeff, and who are you? And he said, I'm a pastor. I said, what if you lose your job? 
Who are you? He says, I'm a husband. I said, what if your wife leaves you? Who are you? I'm a father. I said, what if your kids die? He said, you need to be identified by something that can't be taken away. If your identity isn't securely in something that is going to last, then you'll always be living a life of insecurity and fear. And, and, and that will lead you to a kind of life that you're trying to protect and trying to hold on to things. And you won't have the kind of freedom that you read about that the early church leaders had where they were willing to die for their faith. They were willing to lose all for the sake of Christ because their identity was in something that was lasting. You know, the Apostle Paul says this in 2 Corinthians 5, like, uh, this, this is wasting away, but what I have is an eternal home that cannot fade, cannot fall apart. And he knew, he was grounded in what wouldn't change. And if we aren't grounded in what will not change, then we'll kind of be shifting all the time. And we'll run with each new trend. And what I want to make sure that we don't do today is we don't talk about a new trend in the church uh, as to how we can be better and do more. And I'm like, no, I don't want to get, let's get back to what will not change. And that is who God is, what He's done, and who we are in Christ. If we get that right, then we'll be able to answer the question of what we do appropriately. But if we don't get those first three questions right, who God is, what He's done, who we are, then we'll answer the what we do in the wrong way. We'll begin with what we do in order to make ourselves something. And this is back in the garden. This isn't a new idea. You remember Adam and Eve way back in the very beginning. God says, let us make man in our image. In the image of God, He created them. Male and female, He created them. And so there's image bearers, men and women. They both are like God. Uh, and yet, what does the evil one do? He comes into the garden and says, did God really say that you must not eat of this tree? And they, Eve says, oh yeah, He said that if I, we eat it or even touch it in the day that we do it, surely we'll die. He knows that, that that's not true. God knows that when you eat it, you will become like Him. So what does He say from the very beginning? Don't trust in what God has done to make you who you are. See, God's being led to God's doing, and we'll talk about that in a sec. What He does is always consistently connected to who He is, which led to our being, which is we're made in the likeness of God, which means we do what is like God. But what does the, the tempter do? He comes in and he says, no, you aren't like God. Why don't you eat, and then you can make yourself like God. In other words, put your confidence in what you do to make you who you are. This is the beginning of works righteousness, just so you know. It's, it was at that moment when the evil one said, I know he said you're very good. He's wrong. You're not very good. I know he said you're like him. He's wrong. You're not like him. You have to do something in order to become something. So when you eat of this fruit, you will finally be like God. And that's the beginning of, that's, that's the worldliness that we are dealing with on a daily basis. When we talk about the idea that we're, our enemies are the world, the flesh, and the devil, the world is saying that to you over and over and over again. What you do makes you who you are. Now here's the problem. That worldliness slips right into the church. And we're defining the church by what we do instead of what God's done. And so we don't have a gospel-centered perspective of who we are. We have a works-based-centered understanding of who we are. And so when we do really well, we feel great. And when we do really poorly, we feel terrible. And so that's why we have measurements, like was said even back here, a great church is a big church. Now, I'm not against size, big, small, it doesn't matter. Uh, but that's not what makes us great. What makes us great is Jesus. And as soon as we start putting our confidence in what we do to make us great, we start walking away from Jesus and putting man at the center of the church. I know he's no longer the head, somebody else is. And we don't want to do that. Because if he's not the head, then we're in trouble. Okay, So we want to move in this direction. This is where we're going to go today. Who God is, is going to be the first question that we should be asking over and over and over again. Who is God? So there's going to be a few questions here I'm going to give you that we're going to walk through. And some of you are going to go like, just get to the stuff. Can we just talk about how we do this? And uh, my, my desire for you is that you would get rightly grounded with the right foundation, which would lead you to be able to know how to answer all the questions of what you should do. That you get the order right, that you get the foundation right, that you get, you get the heart right. Because if you don't get that, all you're going to do is you're going to go, what's the newest methodology that seems to be working? And you'll become pure pragmatist. And the gospel is pragmatic, it does work, but you can also be pragmatic and not gospel-centered. So we want to be gospel-centered pragmatist. 
We want to be people who believe the power of God does work, but we want to be about God and not about us. So we're going to ask, who is God? What has he done? Who are we? In light of that. And then I'm going to ask two more questions. What do we do? And this is going to be the unique one. How do we do it? And I'm, for those of you who like big words with ology at the end of them, uh, I'm going to walk through what this is, okay? Some of you are, are like your teacher types and you, you, like, you like systematic thinking. This is a system, just so you, you understand. It's a system for leading people. It's a, uh, hopefully a gospel-centered one. This is theology. Who is God? We're asking the question about what we know about God. Biblically, the way that you come to know the truth about who God is is through what he's done. You can't actually know God apart from God doing something. That's how the entire narrative of the, word, of the, of the Bible works, is you come to know him by what he does. Okay? Now, the, the beauty is, how do we most fully know who God is? As Christians, what's the, the pinnacle of that? Jesus. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. No one has seen God, and yet he's made himself known to us through his Son, Jesus Christ. So you actually now can see in, in bodily form what God is like. Paul says to the Colossians, the fullness of the deity dwelt in bodily form in Jesus Christ. And so we know what he's done, we know what he's like by looking at what he's done in particular in and through Jesus Christ. And that's what makes us distinctly Christian, by the way. If you think you can know God apart from Christ, you're not Christian. Okay, you're probably Jewish or Muslim or something else, but if you, if you find a way to get to know God apart from Jesus, you're actually walking away from the fundamentals of Christianity at that point, okay? And we'll come back to that in a second. Then, so this is our Christology, theology, Christology. It's how we see God's rule and reign expressed in all of life. It's the embodiment of God in his actions, uh, and that happens all the way through the Bible, not just in the New Testament, all the way through the Old Testament as well, there is Christ in the Old Testament. And uh, we won't do all that today, but this nation contributed significantly to that conversation around the world, thankfully, to, thankful, and I'm thankful for the good biblical uh, Christ-centered theology that came out of Australia. I mean, it's really significantly impacted me, at least, and many others. Uh, then we're going to ask, who are we? And I'm going to suggest this is ecclesiology. Most people's discussion of ecclesiology is in what we do. And I think that's, a, I think that's where we're broken. Um, and for some of you, you don't care about this conversation. It's okay, just hang on. We'll get to the stuff you, you care about. For some of you, you this, care, this means a lot to you. And I, I think it's fundamentally uh, imperative that we make this shift, that we move away from ecclesiology being described over here, what we do, and get back to describing it over here, what, who we are. Because ecclesiology, for those of you who don't know, that's the study of church. Ecclesia is the word for church in the Bible. Ecclesia means gathering. That's why a lot of people land on the idea that church is a gathering. But the biblical understanding of ecclesia is God's gathered ones, the ones who are gathered to himself. And so they could be the gathered people when they're not in the room together, which is Paul's writing, uh, I'm sorry, Peter's writing to the scattered church. In 1 Peter, he calls them living stones. He says, you are God's people even though you're scattered throughout the whole region. Uh, you're still his people. You're his living temple. Uh, so it, it, you didn't need to be in the same room to be ecclesia. Ecclesia is God's people gathered unto Christ, even if they're not in the same room together. Uh, so that's ecle ec ecclesiology is where we get that from. Who are we as the church? This is our missiology. What do we do? In other words, how do we express who we are to the world as God's missionary people? And we understand mission primarily by understanding how Jesus was the primary missionary. Jesus says, as the Father sent me, so I send you. Well, how did he send him? The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, filled and empowered by the Holy Spirit to live the life that we are meant to live all amongst the people that he's trying to save. And so that's how we understand missiology. It's the, the people of God filled with the Spirit of God for the purposes of God in all of life. Versus there's just some who are called to be missionaries. And we send them elsewhere, but the rest of us, we just attend church. So when you understand missiology as it's God's people on God's mission in all of life, that'll change your perspective of yourself. Okay? And then lastly, how do we do it? This is the unique contextualization 
And contextualization means how do you apply all these truths in a particular place for that particular people? This is where most people spend all their time defining the church. Like, well, we do this kind of event and this kind of music and, you know, this kind of lighting and this kind of miking and, and you know, you, you, it's all very, very specific. And, and it's not bad, by the way, just so you don't hear me wrongly. It's good to talk through how do you work out what it means to be God's people in a particular place. It's going to look different in every place depending on who God sends there and who's, who's trying to be reached and all that. That's the beauty is there's all kinds of creativity in the expression of God's people throughout the centuries. But what happens is most people actually define church right here. It's just a very unique methodology that a few have found to be effective. So what I'm going to spend most of our time in the first half of the day is right here. Okay? Because I'm convinced if we get this right, these will be a lot easier to figure out. But if we get these wrong, we're just going to be tossed to and fro by the newest fad and strategy that some church leader thinks is the best for you. And I don't know that we should do that. I think you've got to wrestle with these things first before you answer these things rightly. That make sense? Yeah. Peter? Peter, right? Right. Yep. Just wondering, uh, do you see it as a, you know, yeah, you'll get there, I guess, uh, but do you see that as a progression? We've got to, it's foundational, kind of, who is God? We've got to answer that first, then we can answer the next, then we can, so, and I'm particularly interested in, if you're going to uh, summarize uh, or define uh, our, uh, what do we do as missiology? Um, are you getting that out of who we are? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Um, and I mean, I, I can be patient and wait for the answer yeah. when you plan to do it. But I'm um, yeah. just, just thinking, I guess the thought in my head is, is missiology sufficient? As in, uh, our mission, is that a sufficient understanding of all that we do? Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah, anyway, so I'm, I'm happy to wait for the Yeah, end. yeah. And, I, and I'm probably overly simplifying it to make it easier to be transferable. It's, I, what we're going to do today will not be as complex as what you could do if you really iron this out in every aspect of the biblical narrative. Uh, but I've found that most church people, we, we tend to never engage in the right conversation because we... Some of us go into a room and have lots and lots of conversations about it, but we don't make it transferable for them. So this is my desire to make it easily, easily accessible to the everyday person. It's like, for instance, just so you know, my kids actually can answer these questions. That's what I'm after. Now, not to the level you and I would, but I can say, tell me, kids, who's God? And one, they, they'll say, he's our father. And I'll say, well, how, how do you know that? Well, because he loves us like children. How did you know that? He sent Jesus, his son. Okay, well, then who are you? We're his children. Well, what does that mean? If we're God's children, what do we do? We love one another. Okay? Anybody right now in your life that needs to be loved? Yeah. How would you do that to them? How would you show them God the Father's love in a way that makes sense to their world? My kids can have that conversation, see? So that's what I'm actually doing is I'm trying to create a framework where which I can form up people in the most basic ways of what it means to be and, and do what God's called us to do and be. So, that's, so I may not go as far as you'd like it to because I know there'd be a bunch of people going, like, you're really oversimplifying that. Or maybe that's, that's too broad of a definition for missiology because missiology is uniquely God's sending of his people into a particular place. And I would just say I'm trying to simplify it if that's okay. So. Any other questions about that before we go on? By the way, I just gave you the first one, so... We'll call, walk through it a bit. Yeah. Tag team with Pete, Go ahead. Yes, I know. Uh, but so, yeah, I wonder whether is Pete your question sort of around missiology that because you say you know we're we're a child of the Father and so you know who do we bring into our family but we still have family life. Right. Um, yeah, and, and so the you know as Paul speaks to the Church of Corinth, he says expel the immoral brother from among you. You know, like you're doing stuff. It's Corinth is in the church. Yeah. You've got to think about how you live together as God's people. Yeah. Um, but, you know, but at the same time, you're saying, you know, but be careful about what you're eating because people might think that you, you're an idol worshipper. So be conscious of the unbeliever. Right. So, yeah, is it too narrow to say all we do as the children of God is, is we try to engage people and, and get them in our family? Um, Let's back up now. So it's, it's okay we have this conversation? It's good, guys. So when, when God wanted to have a family, which was Israel, what was his reason for having that family in the world? 
To be a blessing to the nations. Yep. To glorify Him, to show the world what God is like and the way they love one another. So remember, his complaints against Israel are all the ways in which they fail to show the nations what he's like in the way that they fail to love one another and love the stranger that comes from outside. And so that, what is that? That's mission. A people put into the world to bring God glory so that all the nations will come to know what their God is like. And it was a family identity that was to live that mission out. Now we come to Corinthians. Why is God so concerned about the immoral brother? Because what he's doing is he's telling a lie about God's family to the world. That's a missionary heartbeat. They're going to think that God doesn't care about any of these things. We can just destroy relationships all we want. It really doesn't matter. That's what God is like. No, he's not. So that person is saying he represents God's family, but he doesn't. So we've got to get him out of the family so as not to hurt the missionary heartbeat of God to tell the truth about what he's like to the world so that the outsider can look in and say, now we know what God's like. He's committed to faithfulness in relationships, in particular in sexuality in that case. So that's why, that's why we do that. Now, the other reason we do that is because we want that person to come back into the family. That's church discipline. So that they would go, man, we, we, we want you to be a part of this. We want you to know the love of God, but you are acting in such a way that you can't experience the love of God because you're actually walking away from God in your sin. So we want to see you restored back to God. So we, we're going to do church discipline, as it were, but we want to do it gently because we want to restore you gently back into the family. That's good for the, the member. That's loving one another. But it's good for the mission because it, it's by their, our love for one another that they'll know we're his disciples, John 13. So every single action that we do together as a church is not just for ourselves. It's for the glory of God to be seen and expressed throughout the world. Does that make sense? So that, when, when, we dis, when, we, when we separate those, that's where we get in trouble. Is when we go like, well, well we just love, you know, who's, who's in and who's out? Versus we exist for the sake of the nation, for the glory of God. And then every action is something that we do to one another for the sake of his glory and the good of all the nations. And we, we can't separate those. Unfortunately, church has really divided those up. Like, miss, missionaries think about that, but we don't. But we need to think about every activity as a missionary activity. Did I answer it or not? Yeah, I think so. I mean, yeah, as you were saying that, I'm thinking about, you know, because, you, yeah, you look at Israel, and they were meant to be the prophets to the, the priests to the nation. They yeah. mediated the knowledge of God to the nations. Yeah. And even in Ezekiel as well, you see that it's for the honor and glory and fame that God will restore his name. And, yeah. you know, like Ezekiel 34 That's through right. 37. And, yeah, so I like it. I like it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you're helping me to think. Good. Yeah. That's part of my desire today is to, to get you to be able to become really good thinkers about these key questions because we'll make better decisions about what we do as far as how the church expresses this if we keep asking ourselves, well, how would those questions inform this? It'll also make people much better with how they read their Bible because even this little inter interaction we're having hopefully is making people, if you're listening in, go, Oh, wow, i got to think about what the entire Bible story tells me about that particular passage, not just that passage. And then when you see the grand narrative of God's plan, we're going to become much better Bible people. Okay? All right? Any other questions before we move on? This is, this is kind of the... This is it. This is where we're going today, by the way. We're going to walk through all of this together. So that's, I'm just giving you the framework of where we're going. And hopefully it'll give you a transferable skill. Okay, turn in your Bibles to Matthew 28. Those of you who are equippers or leaders in the room that are sent to equip God's people, um, let me encourage you that whenever you think about what you're teaching or doing with people, that you continue to ask yourself, could this be, tr could this be transferred? Could this be reproduced? Could someone else take this and do this with another? And if we don't, then we end up creating, without knowing it, a kind of a new papacy, you know, a, a new kind of popism, where it's like, what I do, you could never do. And as long as I keep making sure you know that you could never do this, I'll always have a job, and you'll always be in need of me. And that's a, that's a form of building a codependency into the church that's not healthy. Um, the same thing with your children. If you're parents, you want to raise up your children the way they should go. You don't raise them up in the way they should stay. So the goal is you're training them to be able to go. So every time you're thinking about everything you do with them, you're thinking about how am I going to train them so they won't need me someday. But unfortunately, as a parent, part of what, if we're not careful, what you get your identity from is being needed by your children. And that's going to be, hurt. That's going to be really hard to let go of them someday 
if that's what you think you are here for, is to just be needed. You're not here to be needed. You're here to be able to create interdependent humans. We all need each other, there's no doubt, but we also bring something to the table to give to someone else. So I'll give you a little example of that. The reason why I'm saying this is because I want you to think throughout the day, okay, could, how would I teach this so it's transferable and reproducible so that I can make disciples who make disciples. I'm not trying to make disciples. I'm trying to make disciples who can make disciples. That's the difference. We're talking about multiplication, not just addition. Okay? And so how would I do that? Um, I'll give you just an example of this. With my son, uh, years ago, I remember he was probably about five when this happened. We were having a prayer time. I pray with each one of the kids at, their, at bedtime. And uh, so he and I were having our bedtime prayers, and at this time, he, he, he and I were getting on our knees, and we'd pray by the bedside, and I, I'd always ask, so son, why are we on our knees? And, and the, it was like a little catechism I was doing with him, my little homemade catechism, and, and he'd say, well, because we need God. So that's right. <laughs> and, uh, and then, yeah, it's, yeah, ha, ha. <laughs> Francesca liked that. But it was, he could remember that, see? And then, then I'd say, um, why else are we on our knees? Because he's our king and we bow down to him. Good, okay? Okay, so why don't we bow down to our king in prayer and talk to him? And I remember doing that with him one time, and I said, hey, Caleb, would you like to pray tonight? He said, no. <laughs> You're like, that's not what I wanted to hear. And, and I said, why not? He goes, because I don't really know how to pray. So would you like me to teach you? I've been doing it with you, but I want you to learn how to pray. And he said, no. <laughs> said, okay. So before we pray, I want to remind you that someday you're going to have to teach your children how to pray. And I want to do my best to help you know how to do that well someday. So let me know when you're ready, and I really want to train you. So we started praying, and as we got in the middle of the prayer, I heard, Dad? And I stopped. He said, will you teach me to pray? And that's the beginning when he first started praying. Why did he do that? One, because he probably just thought dad valued that. I'm sure there's a little bit of like, I want dad to be proud of me. I know that happens in our kids, if we're real honest. Sometimes they just do it because they want us to say, I'm proud of you, son. And that's okay. I don't think that's all bad, as long as we continue to let them know we're proud of them when they don't do it. You know? but, um, but I think there's another part of him that started thinking, wait a minute, I better get good at this if I'm going to have to train someone else in it. And I, I had built, I'd put in that moment a seed of multiplication into my son. That what I do with you, you're going to do with others. And that's what Jesus did with his disciples. Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. What I'm going to do with you, I'm going to call you to do with others eventually. And so that's what I'm trying to do here as well is say, let's be careful that we don't build a new papacy that says, I can always do this for you. You could never do this without me. You will forever need me. And Jesus himself did not do that. I mean, we forever need him. There's no doubt about it. But the beauty is he, he trained his disciples to go and do what he did with them. And we want to do that in the church. We want to train people to do what we do. Um, and maybe today you're going, I don't even know how to do it. So let's walk through maybe some things that might help you. Matthew 28, verse 16. The 11 disciples went to the Galilee, to the mountain, to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Now that's, by the way, if you're ever wondering, I mean, people say Jesus never claimed to be God. There's, your, there's a, plenty of them in the Bible that tells us he believed he's God, but this is one of them. They worshipped him, and any good Jewish person knows that you shall not worship any other God. You know, Hear, O Lord, the Lord our God is one. You shall have no other gods before you, and yet Jesus accepts their worship. He doesn't correct them or rebuke them, he accepts it. Uh, but some doubted, and that's an encouraging passage for me, to be honest, because it tells me that discipleship is a process, that it doesn't just happen, that it's constantly going on. And so here they've been with him for over three years and they're still struggling. They watched him die. They've seen him rise again. They see a real living, resurrected body and they're still struggling with doubt. And I think that's encouraging for all of us who probably do struggle with doubt, if we're honest. Jesus came and said to them, and this is how he, I love how he speaks into their doubt, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. I'm king of everything. That's amazing. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. By the way, that tells you this is not an option. Okay, you don't, It's not like some get to be disciple makers and others don't. Jesus said, I am king. I have all authority over heaven and earth. Therefore, I get to tell you what to do. So if you have kind of a concept that it's kind of, you know, you don't all have to be committed to this. 
Jesus is really clear here. He has authority over everyone and over everything, and so he's now commanding that he does that we do what he says. So go and make disciples of all nations. That's all people groups all over the world. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. Behold, I'm with you always to the end of the age. Now, do you see all that's in here? Who is God in this passage? By the way, this is a very good... Teach people this technique of how to study their Bible. You know, instead of like... I, I'm not anti K. Arthur and all the inductive study stuff, but the problem is, is oftentimes you can walk away and still not get Jesus. And a lot of times you end up with uh, application of what to do without getting to understand who you are. And so you, if you're not careful, you just enter into a new moralism or legalism in that form of study. So we want to do a little bit more, who is God, what has he done, not just what does this say and what do I do? Because that's, that's oftentimes how people read their Bible. They don't get to know God. But this is eternal life, that they might know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you sent, John 17, 3. So we want to get to know God. So who is God here? Jesus. You know, all, they worship him. Who, who is Jesus? What else do we know about him? He's king. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Now, what, is we, what has he done? You actually have to read Matthew to get this. So you aren't going to get it just in these couple verses. But just briefly, let's review. What has Jesus done up to this point? Go, go all the way back. He's healed, yep. Go all the way back to the beginning. He's taught people. Okay, he's taught people. What'd you say? He came. He, he's the God who became flesh. You know, the incarnation. So, takes on flesh. We know, according to Matthew's account, he's, he's the promised Messiah to come. And we see that he's in the line of David and you know, fulfilling Abraham's, the promise to Abraham. And we see all the covenants being laid out, that he's the fulfillment of all of them in Matthew. That happens. And of course, Hebrews is the way that we look back and understand Matthew, because Hebrews tells us he did fulfill every one of them. But Matthew's making sure that we don't miss it in his life. Okay, so he, he lives amongst us. He healed. What else did he do? Proved his authority over creation with, the, with the, the miracles, with authority over demons. I mean, all these things. What was the other thing we said? Yeah, that was easy. Okay, great, great. So we could keep going. There's a whole bunch. We, we look at all of his life, and, and Matthew is, gives us a ton of stuff to know about who Jesus is by what he's done, okay? So we could say, let's even just say, authority over demons. Okay, who is Jesus now that he has authority over demons? God. Yeah. And they even say, I mean, Mark's a little bit more uh, clear on this. And Mark, he's one of the, he, one of the few, first, one of the gospel writers who tells us the people who really truly recognize Jesus were the demons, they're about the only ones who figured out who Jesus was. Uh, they knew who he was, and they were afraid of him. And so we, get, we know what he's done. Now, who are we in this passage? Jesus says, baptize them into the name of. Now, you, if you know your, your biblical narrative, your story, the story of God throughout, uh, from Old to New Testament, what, what happens when someone gets a new name? What's going on? New identity. New identity. And that new identity is connected to a new purpose. Okay, what is Abraham? What was his first name? Abram. Then he's called Abraham. When God gives him the name Abraham, what does the name mean? Father of many nations. Now, it's interesting when you read where that happened, God actually says, you will be a father of many nations. Now, what's amazing is God calls them a name before anything happens. This is, this is the way God works. Remember Adam and Eve. What does he say? You're very good. They've done nothing. <laughs> right? Just came out of dust. And then out of a rib. You're very good. They didn't have to do anything. God declares them righteous. Right in that moment. That's Very good is another way of saying you are righteous. So God says you're righteous. Abraham believes God. And God what credits it to him as righteousness. He doesn't do a thing. He hasn't had a baby. He's not been a blessing to the nations. Abraham's done nothing God declares him to be something before he does anything. And then what he does is based upon God's declaration. Who you are leads to what you do, Abraham. You're going to be a blessing to the nations because that's what I said you are. And because I said it, you'll be it. God speaks, creation comes into existence. That's how it works. God's word brings about life. God says something and it is. And what it is, it does. You follow that? This is super imperative for understanding what it means to be a Christian. God does something, you become something, apart from you doing anything. 
And then by faith, you believe that, and then you walk it out in what you do. And what you do tells you what you believe about what God has done, which tells you what you believe about who He is. That's how it always works. Okay? Now, we're going to go after our baptismal identity in a sec, but I want to just walk this out, what I just said, in a real tangible, kind of hands-on, experiential way that I went through with my wife, because I want to give you a tool, if possible, of how you can begin to lead people into repentance. Okay? So my wife, at one point, was being anxious, living with a lot of anxiety. And, of course, how that got expressed was in some overly controlling behaviors with our children, trying to control their whole world. Because, you know, what you love most, you most fear losing, and then whatever threatens that is what you try to keep away. And so she was living with a ton of fear and anxiety because there's a whole bunch of things over here that were threatening what our kids might become someday. So... And that, when you get to that place, you just feel very enslaved and very powerless and victimized at times. So there's a lot of anxiety. And I just stopped and asked. And by the way, anxiety is not a bad thing. It's God's gift to you. It's like a temperature. You know, when, you're, when you have a fever, it's not bad that you have a fever. It's telling you you're actually working right. It's telling you something's wrong inside you, and your body's telling you something's wrong inside you. It's the indicator light coming on. Uh-oh, problem. So like God designed you to experience that. Um, when you don't experience the fruit of the Spirit, that's God's gift to you to tell you that your mind is not set on the Spirit. And the Spirit's job is to set your mind on Christ. So at that point, you're not believing the truth of Jesus when you're not experiencing the fruit of the Spirit. It's a good gift that God would give you. We ought to pay attention to the, the indicator lights on our dashboard, you know, as it were. That's an indicator light. So anxiety, we shouldn't go like, oh, anxiety, horrible. No, anxiety is a gift telling us something about our wrong, our wrong beliefs. So at that point, I stopped and asked Janie, right now, who do you believe you are? She said, well, I believe I am in control. So then I said, then why are you anxious? I am not in control. <laughs> That's her anxiety. Now, if we were to keep going, we, we, just, we could stop right here and say, who does Janie believe is God around here right now? her, that she should be sovereign, that she should be able to control her world and control our kids' world and control all the influences that come in our kids' lives, and she can't. Only God can do that. There's only one who's that in control. We're not. One of the biggest lessons you'll learn as you continue to grow you know, and get older is that you'll realize you lived under kind of a facade or a fallacy of believing that you actually had more control than you really do. You really don't have much control at all. Uh, when you, when you, as you get older, you realize lots of things can happen to you that were completely outside of your control. Uh, and so you actually have to believe someone else is in control, otherwise you're in trouble. And so at one point I said, what does that tell you about what God, you believe God has done? Because she was believing she should be in control. What do you think she said? What has God done? She said, he's abandoned me. Now, by the way, my wife has given me permission to share this, so you might be going, like, why are you like, throwing your wife under a bus? And, um, <laughs> uh, the thing, one thing is I love about, about Janie is she's, she's you know, when, remember Thomas says, can anything good come from Nazareth? And she just goes, all oh, right, there's a guy I like. No guile in you. That's my wife. She just says it like it is. I love this about her. So she's like, this is what I believe. I believe he's abandoned me. She said, I believe he, he stopped loving me. So what else? She said, I believe he's lost control. Now, by the way, we all believe this at times. We really do. Okay? And I said, well, then what does that tell you about who God is? She said, I believe he's absent. I believe he's unloving. And I believe he's impotent. Now, man, saying that stuff out loud, I'm kind of going like... I <laughs> and yet my wife has taught me and you read the psalms the psalmists are really honest about what they think about God at times I'm growing in this myself personally I'll tell you I, I, I begged God for something for about two months this last winter and I mean I literally was, I, I found myself probably praying two or three times a day in urgent desire like God give us this we need it I fasted and prayed. I did everything I knew in my power to try and obey what he told me to do, and, and we didn't get it. I remember I was reading through John chapter 14. If you ask anything in my name, this will I do. 
And I was reading through that. I said, God, I don't believe you anymore. I don't believe that you will give us whatever we ask for in your name. And I remember saying that, going like, I can't believe I just said that. But the truth was, I didn't believe it. I was, and I want to encourage you, be honest about what you're really going through. That's called confession. Confessing. And that, is that unbelief? It sure is. Is unbelief sin? Yes, it is. But I can go to my God and confess that I need help. I don't believe you anymore. I'm struggling with this. I read it in your word, but I'm not experiencing it. And what's amazing is God really met me in that place. In fact, I've got a new, as of the last few months, I have a new intimacy with him because of me being real and honest about that part of me that really struggles with him. And this, this by the way, is confession. A confession isn't I did wrong. Confession is I believe wrong. If we don't know how to confess the lies we've been believing about God, that, we're, that they're there, I know they are, in all of you. If not, you'd be perfected. perfected you know? You'd be complete. You'd be, you'd be done. But you still struggle. Just like the disciples did. They worshipped him, but some doubted. Janie worships Jesus. He's, she still doubts. And so she confessed. This was confession right here. Okay? And then, she, it was funny, because all of a sudden she said, but I don't really believe that. So what was going on in her confession? The Spirit of God was reminding her of what is true. I love that about confession. When you confess it out loud, it's like all of a sudden you go like, that's not the God I worship, but that's who I've been worshiping. See, and repentance is not a change of behavior. Most people would be like, I'm anxious, I'm anxious, I'm anxious. Don't worry, be happy. You know? <laughs> and we think that's repentance. Like, stop worrying, be happy. And so we know that repentance means turn, but it really means metanoia. As the Greek word metanoia means have a change of mind about who is God around here and what he's like. But we tend to think repentance is stop doing one behavior, start doing another behavior. That's worldliness. That's behavior modification. You can't change your behavior. Your beliefs have to change so that you change, so that your view of God changes, so that your obey, obey, obedience of God changes. That's how it works. So what Janie needed is to say, I right now I'm worshiping an absent, unloving, impotent God. Oh, I just said that out loud. Whoa. Okay, that's confession. Repentance is when the Spirit of God says, you're worshiping the wrong God. Turn and see the truth of who God is in Jesus Christ. He's not absent. He's not unloving. He's not impotent. The God you worship is somebody else. Now, let me turn you to that God, and that's repentance. It's the turn. And so I said, babe, it's when her mind is changed. That's right. That's not the God that I worship. I said, who is he? She said, he's loving. Now, it's not sufficient enough to say God is love. How do we know God is love? Romans 5.8. This is how you know that God loves you. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So I said, sweetheart, how do you know he loves you? She said, Christ died for me. That's how I know. That's the only way you can know. You can't know the love of God apart from Jesus Christ and what he's done for you at the cross. Otherwise, it's just an idea. It's a doctrinal statement of faith. Uh, but it's not actually filled with faith. Yeah, we live by the faith of the Son of God who loved us and gave himself for us, Galatians 2.20. So all of a sudden, she goes, yes, he's loving, and I know that because he died for me on the cross. And I said, great, what else do you know to be true of him? And she goes, I believe that he is powerful. He's not impotent. Okay, the Spirit is giving her this. This is the beauty of when people confess their sins and they have the Spirit of God, he will bring them back to God in their faith. And so how do we know he's powerful? She said, well, he rose from the dead. That's a tombstone being rolled away. <laughs> okay? He rose from the dead. If, if there's ever a place where we see the power of God, if there's ever a taste where, think about this, if there's ever a time it looked like God was out of control, when is it? It's when he's in the tomb. Like, you might still think he's in control while he's hanging on the cross because you might go, at any moment, he's going to call a legion of angels and he's going to kill them all. And you go, no, no, he died. He's dead. What are we going to do now? Can you imagine what the disciples must have felt? Three and a half years following the Messiah, hearing about the kingdom, anticipating his rule and reign breaking in. The rulers and the authorities are going to be disarmed. They're going to be destroyed. His kingdom is going to be an eternal kingdom. And now he's dead. And can you imagine what it's like to feel that? I mean, just, we can't imagine because we weren't there. If you've ever lost someone you love dearly and you know that they're really dead, 
you, 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 there's a lot of hopelessness. There's, a lot, there's like a what now kind of feeling. Can you imagine? That's the Messiah, the God-man that you, that you worship. He's dead. If there's ever a time it seems like God's out of control, it's when he's in a tomb. But we know that he was putting death to death as well. Not just dying for sin, he was destroying the power of death. And then he rose again from the dead to prove that he has a power and authority over all things, including our worst enemies. So if he's, he was completely in control the entire time, even while in a tomb, then how much more is he in control of our situation and our children? We can trust him. And I had to remind that Janie of that. Remember, he's not out of control. He's our God. And he has all authority. And then she said, I believe that he's present. And I said, how do you know that? And I don't know how to draw a dove, so that's the spirit. And just so it's clear, the spirit is not a dove. He just descended on Jesus in bodily form like a dove. So there was no dove-looking thing coming down. It was a body coming down on Jesus. The spirit of God came and filled him, but he descended like a dove. So I don't know what that would have looked like, but that's pretty cool. I would love to have been there. And so I said, how do you know he's present? She said, he's with us by his spirit. I said, do you, do you know that right now, that he is with you, that he loves you, that he's powerful for you? She said, yeah. And so I said, then who are you? She said, well, I'm loved. I said, what else? She said, I'm more than a conqueror through Christ. What else? She said, I'm not alone. He's with me. Okay, so babe, what do you do? What are you experiencing right now? And she said, I'm experiencing love and joy and peace. And by the way, this was several hours. I, I just did this in a few minutes. It was several hours of talking and listening and praying and talking about the truth of who God is and what he's done and who we are. And what that led to is she was being able to start to release our children into the hands of God. Okay? So the reason why I give you this is because this is gospel-centered repentance based in the nature and character of God through his work in Jesus Christ. And we want to lead, keep leading people in this over and over again because if we lead them in this, they'll start to actually be the church he meant them to be, which is centered on Christ and living a life that's free and obedient to his commands. Yes? Um, what happens though is sometimes when people can say all of that, see the truth of it, but they're actually not feeling it or, or, or this, yeah, do you, do you know what I mean? Like you can, you can biblically see all of that truth and yeah. still not be engaged with it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've, I've, I don't have time to tell you every story of, of those kinds of situations, but I, I'm in them a lot. And usually what I do is I go back and I say, I ask the Holy Spirit to reveal the truths of Jesus in prayer. So I'll pray over them, Lord, would you re reveal through your spirit these truths to their heart mm -hmm. and, and continue to, and it may, it's not just, I'm not trying to give you like a quick fix, mm -hmm. but I might ask right now, what are you believing about him? Let's be honest, what do you really believe about him right now? What do you really believe about yourself right now? What do you really believe about what he's done right now? And we're going to keep getting them to keep confessing out loud their sin. Um, now, so you have to get back to that basic, what, what is their real belief? That's right. And they have to... Because there's a difference between stating what you should believe and stating what you do believe. It's a big difference. And, a, and in a confessional church, which is what we are, when I, and I'm not against a confessional church, but in a confessional church, we often confess what we know we should believe, not what we really do believe. And what we need to do is give people the freedom to confess what they really believe so the Spirit of God can meet them in that place and bring them to faith in Christ. And it takes trust and relationship. Yeah. I mean, you're going to find as we keep talking through the day, the way we've been living as the church doesn't allow for this to happen very much. And that's part of the point I'm going to be making is we've got to rethink how we make disciples who can make disciples if we're expecting this kind of stuff to happen. It won't happen if it's just a quick one-hour get in, get out, and that's it. You'll never get to this stuff. You know, and you love, I love Jesus' pattern. He's only got about 12 or so he's hanging out with for three and a half years to do this kind of work with on a daily basis. You go like, man, that's probably a better picture of what church should look like. And he still has the crowds that he gathers with, five to 20,000 when he's preaching, but the people he's making disciples of are those few. And, and if, if the church said, let's get everybody into smaller groups that really were living this way, we'd probably make more disciples who can make disciples, even if we gather them in a building on a Sunday knowing that that's very insufficient to actually accomplish this. It might create a framework for this, but it won't do this. 
Yeah, your hand. Yeah, just thinking, um, so part of community is going to be, uh, and love is going to be walking with someone, but that might take months, yes. maybe, months, That's right. I suppose. Yeah, the guy that I just had the privilege of handing the baton off of our local leadership of the day-to-day -day of our church, which I used to lead, now I hand it off to him, his name is Randy, and we went through five years of this kind of work with him. And now he's leading our church through it, you know, and I think he's, a, and he's growing in his leadership, and he has days where he doesn't believe any of it, you know, like, not, all, not any of it, but he has days where he doesn't believe certain parts of it, you know, and, and I remember, you know, I was praying with him regularly, by the way, just a little side note, you'll know what people believe by praying with them, because that's confession. Our prayer life is, our, is probably one of our most our easiest ways to know what we're confessing to, that we believe, because we're actually saying it out loud in our prayers, so... The way he would pray often was, um, it sounded a bit like this, and I, I've got his permission to do this too, actually. Um, and he, he said, Lord God, would you just, God, Lord God, would you just. It was like that kind of justifying statement. God was high and lofty, and I needed to justify myself to him before I could ask him for anything. That was his prayer life. And we prayed together for a few months, and I finally stopped and said, hey, I've never heard you call God your father. You know that you can approach him like a dad, right? He said, yeah, of course, like, he's, you know, God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit, you know, <laughs> confessional belief. I said, well, let's go to our daddy. Lord God, would you just, and he just went back to the old, and I said, hold on, stop. Do you believe he's your loving father that sent his son to die for your sins, that while you were an enemy of God, he still loved you, and if you were an enemy of God, he loved you to that degree, how much more now that you're a son of God would he love you? So he loves you dearly. Lord God, would you just, and just kept going. So I was like, okay. Now here's the thing, here's what was a big kicker, and this is one thing they want us to pay attention to. I knew Randy's story. He had a very abusive dad. And uh, so when he thought dad, he thought earth dad, not heavenly dad. And so at one point, the Spirit just encouraged me to remind him that he had to repent of worshiping the wrong dad. So I said, Randy, it sounds to me like you still have a picture of father that's defined largely by your earthly dad. I want to call you to repent of that and turn to the true picture of Father as seen in Jesus. You said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So I want to pray that the Holy Spirit gives you a picture of Jesus as Father instead of earthly Father as Father. Now, he didn't, well, still wasn't able to pray that way. And so I said, I, I, all I can do now is ask that the Spirit would reveal this to you. And I have to go. I'm, I've got to get to a meeting. I, I hate the fact that I've got to leave. But I want to encourage you to, to press into him and ask him to reveal the Father's heart for you. That's what the Spirit was given to you for. Romans 5.5, 5, he'll pour the Father's love into your heart. Romans 8, you can call out Daddy by the, the Spirit that he gives you. So if you've got the Spirit, which I believe you do, he can enable you to know God as Father. So ask him to show you that. So we left. He got into his room. He told me he got on his knees and began to beg to say, Lord God, would you please show me yourself? Holy Spirit, would you reveal the love of the Father to me? And he said in that moment, the, the Father's love was poured into his heart, and he had a new picture of God that he'd never had before. And he, he just began to weep as he experienced God's love just pour over him. And it changed the way he loved others because you can't actually do something unless it's been done to you. That's how it works. So like, it's got to happen to you. Now the way it happens to you is by God's Spirit. So he was experiencing the love of God, so now he can love others. Does that, does that help a little bit? Yeah, so, so the truth is, this is a question, well, kind of, but that's our, that's our state all the time, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. So together, it's, it's what we're all trying to work out all the time. That's right. This is working out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it's God who's at work in you both to will and to do according to his good pleasure. Yeah, I would call this, uh, this is the ongoing process of sanctification. Okay, and uh, what I'm summarizing here is sanctification is the ongoing process of the Spirit leading us to confess our unbelief, to put our faith, this is, this is, this is believe and obey. So there's, Confession, repentance, faith, and obedience. And that's, that's sanctification, this constant cycle. And we're going through it on a daily basis. And the reason why I'm trying to break it down for you is because I think people don't even realize what it is, let alone how to go engage in it with the, the gospel-centered approach we need to. So, yeah. And we've got to be patient with people. It's not a fix. We're not trying to fix people. That's, that's his job. We, God is the one who's doing that work. But our job is to keep leading them to confess what they're believing to remind them of what's true in Jesus, to call them to put their faith in Jesus, and then in light of that, to then obey, because he gave them a new heart. 
they're new people, they're new creation. And, it, and it's different too because you're not telling them what to think about Jesus. That's right. You're asking them what they mm -hmm. are thinking about. That's right. There's actually three kinds of repentance I've experienced when I've led people through this. One is a repentance of ignorance. Some people don't know. So you might need to tell them. You might need to say, let me tell you, God is a loving Father. Let's show, can I show you how we, he's shown that to you through Jesus? That's repenting of ignorance. Remember Paul says at one point to, the, to a group he's speaking to, God at, for a while overlooked your ignorance, but not so any longer, because he had just preached to them the truth about God. So that's, some people just are ignorant, and they need to be told what is true of God in Christ. Some people, it's unbelief. My wife was experiencing unbelief. Because when she got here, she goes, I don't believe that. But, but what she was doing is she had forgotten. She was not believing the truth about Jesus in that moment. It wasn't that she was ignorant. She just wasn't believing. So that's unbelief. And then there's rebellion, which is, I know, I believe, and I want to do what I want, regardless. And that those are times when we might need to really be more, have more of a rebuke being brought. It's some of what you talked about, casting the immoral brother out. At some point, we, gotta, we have to do a little bit harder work that might be a little more confrontative. But by the way, I just want to encourage you, a lot of people aren't really there. A lot of people are just, they don't know. They don't know who they are in Christ. They don't know what Christ has done for them. They don't know the sufficiency that he is for them. So we want to remind them, okay? And that's where I think we can get in trouble as we can go so quickly to, you're just rebellious. Well, maybe they don't know. Uh, maybe they're struggling with unbelief. Like Jesus' disciples, he doesn't rebuke them for their doubt. He reminds them who he is. And then he reminds them who they are, which is your baptism. Your baptism is your identity statement of you, who you are. You're baptized into the name of the Father, into the name of the Son, into the name of the Spirit. And when you understand a biblical narrative, when you get the name, you get the identity. When you get the identity, you get the ability. That's how it works. Abraham to Abraham, now I'm going to make you a father of many nations. Father, name of the Father, what does that mean? You're dearly loved. You're beloved. So, love one another. That's how that works. Okay? Do I need to take a break, maybe? Okay, we'll take a little break. Um, we're going to come back to this and work out our baptismal identity and how that shapes us as the church. Okay? Let's take 10, 15 minutes, and I'll call you back.